Hello, and welcome to the lecture on chapter 10 of Conceptual Physical Science. So this chapter, chapter 10, is kind of a squeeze chapter. It kind of fits in in a place where we're going from talking about electricity and magnetism before we talk about light in chapter 11. But what's interesting about this chapter is that it's going to help us understand light because light is a wave, which we saw back when we talked about radiation. Okay, so we talked about light being a wave in the chapter on radiation, which was the second of the two thermodynamic chapters. But what's interesting is that the thing about talking about waves is also going to allow us to talk about sound. So this chapter isn't just a squeeze chapter, on the other hand, because it's really the only chapter where we really get to dive into the physics and the physical science of sound waves and how do we deal with, with all the, the intricacies of sound waves. So it both is going to be really important to understand sound, but also lay the groundwork to talk about all the key terms related to waves, which will help us better understand light. Light being something we've hinted at quite a bit because light is such an encompassing idea that just covers so many things. Okay, so that's chapter 10, something to look forward to. Let's take a look at the table of contents. Okay, so we definitely want to define waves, and that's what the first few key points are going to be here. We're going to talk about vibrations and waves, talk about where waves come from. We're going to talk about wave motion, make sure we understand what wave motion is. Then we'll talk about the two types of waves transverse and longitudinal waves. And what's actually really interesting here is we have great examples of both. Longitudinal waves, those are sound waves, okay? Transverse waves, that's light. Now there's actually other important types of transverse waves like stringed instruments, like a violin or something. Those are transverse waves along the string. Also ocean waves are transverse waves. So there's actually more transverse waves than there are longitudinal. But nevertheless, we got two big examples of transverse and longitudinal waves. Then we're gonna formally get into sound waves, define some important things about sound. Then we're going to get into reflection and refraction, specifically for sound, although any wave can reflect and refract. And we'll, we'll talk about what those terms mean, because the words sound so similar. So you got to make sure you can distinguish between reflection and refraction. Then we'll talk about forced vibrations and resonance, which is a really interesting topic. Then we'll talk about interference of waves, because waves have this very interesting phenomenon that when you have two waves stacked on top of each other, they interfere. They don't collide with each other because the waves aren't actually consisting of moving particles exactly. Particles move within the waves, but the waves themselves aren't like moving particles. So you can stack them. And when you stack them, they interfere. You get what's called a superposition, which is just the term for interference. Then we're going to cover something called the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is like when an ambulance goes by and you hear a high pitch when it's approaching you and a low pitch when it's moving away. It's like, right? Or a car engine for that matter. Okay. So that's the Doppler effect. Then we'll talk about some other little kind of side topics like bow waves and sonic boom. That's when you're traveling faster than the speed of sound within the Earth's atmosphere. And then finally, we'll cover some interesting ideas involving musical sound. Okay, and we could have a whole chapter on musical sound, but we're just going to touch on it a little bit here because we don't have time to dive into everything. Because after all, this is a class where we cover all of the physical sciences. So let's get into defining waves. So how are vibrations and waves connected? Well, a vibration is a wiggle in time. Okay. Oh, by the way, a vibration is also known as an oscillation. I may call it that sometimes. It's a term that I use more in my other classes. But oscillation is a vibration. So something that shakes back and forth. Okay. So a wave is a wiggle in space and time. So space and time, okay? And waves always transport energy. They carry energy with them, okay? So that's that's an interesting thing about a wave is it's just a traveling vibration, right? So if you think of a spring, for example, and you think of a mass attached to that spring and you push that spring down, what's gonna happen? Well, the mass attached to the spring, M here for the mass, is gonna bounce up and down, right? It's going to vibrate or wiggle right? Just wiggle up and down. And then if what if you, you put that wiggling spring on wheels and you push it to the side? Well, then you're going to get a wave because if you track the motion, it's going to look like this. It's going to look like a wave moving through space and time. And when we say it moves through space and time, we're not trying to get, you know, super high minded, like, like Einstein's theories of the space time continuum. We're just saying that it's a function of space and time. So if you wanted to know the exact wave position, how far it is above a certain point, the midpoint, you would need to know where you are in space and where you are in time, like how much time has elapsed. Okay, that's all we mean by space and time. Okay, so here is a better drawing than the one I just did. In this case, it's a vertical spring rather than a, well, a flipped upside down vertical spring. Rather than pressing the, the spring, you have pulled it down, all right? 
and there's there's some mass attached to it and then you just let it shake up and down and you could then you know you could actually trace out this wave by saying having a piece of paper like on a conveyor belt and having a pin attached or a crayon attached and it would actually draw this wave and notice this wave is a sine wave that's the mathematical type of wave it is okay which is also the same as a cosine the only difference between the sine and the cosine waves is that one is shifted relative to the other but they have the exact same shape Okay, but there's some really important key terms here. Okay, so there is the wavelength. We have mentioned this before, but it's good to review it. The wavelength is how far in physical distance you have to go to get back to the same point in the wave. So here we've just chosen some arbitrary point that's kind of halfway between what I call the trough, and this is the typical term used for this, just the low point, and the crest. Right, and these are the, the terms you use for like an ocean wave, trough and crest. Right, every between every two crests of ocean waves, there's a trough. The trough is a low point. Okay, and so if you have some point on that wave that's kind of halfway between the trough and the equilibrium, and the equilibrium is just the term that we give to the midpoint. The midpoint being exactly halfway between the trough and the crest. Right, so you have some point there, and then the wavelength is the full distance to get back to that same point. All right. So that wavelength, by the way, is represented by the Greek letter lambda. That's lowercase lambda. There's also the amplitude, which is the distance above equilibrium of either the crest or the trough, because all of our waves are symmetric. And so that's the amplitude. And those are such important terms for understanding waves, wavelength and amplitude, okay? So there are our crests and our troughs, the high points and the low points. See, the textbook agrees that those are the best terms to use, okay? So here, here are the key terms and the characteristics of waves. Make sure you remember amplitude, wavelength, crest, and trough, okay? And for that matter, that the green line is considered the equilibrium, right? The midpoint, all right? Now, I'm, I may call it the midpoint sometimes, but the more technical term is the equilibrium. And it's actually completely accurate to call it an equilibrium because it is, after all, a force equilibrium. And that was the term we used back when we were talking about Newton's laws and understanding forces back in chapter two, because it is a point of balance, a balance point, all right? It's not just the midpoint of the wave, it's in fact a balance point, okay? There we go, the amplitude, the wavelength. Okay, so the distance between adjacent peaks in the direction of travel for a transverse wave, and we'll, we'll formally define transverse wave later, doesn't matter for this check, is its what? Is it its frequency, its period, its wavelength, or its amplitude? The distance between adjacent peaks. Which is it? It is the wavelength, okay? And that's the same as the distance between adjacent troughs, okay? Okay, so a vibration described by frequency all right, because that's the thing. We're saying that vibrations create waves and, you know, vibrating spring, for example, and that's just our example, can create a wave. Other vibrations can, can create waves, such as a vibrating magnet in an electric coil creates an electromagnetic wave, which is light. You can have a vibration due to a pendulum. That would be another example of a vibration. Technically, pendulums create sl slightly non-sinusoidal motion if the swing is really large, but if it's a small swing in a pendulum, that would be another example. But point being, you can have these different types of vibrations. And they all, they all produce waves if they're allowed to, if, they're, if that energy is able to propagate out and away from the vibrating object. Okay, and stringed instruments are like this. And actually, so are wind instruments. In that case, it's the sound, it's the sound wave that's vibrating inside the wind, wind instrument that then is spreading out into the external environment. But point being, when you talk about the vibration, it doesn't make sense to talk about the wavelength because vibrations don't have wavelengths. Vibrations are the cause of the wave. But well, you know what vibrations do have? They have a frequency. Okay, because they have a frequency of how long it takes for the process to repeat, such as the spring going all the way up and back down. Okay, and actually in that case, returning to be coming back up would be a full, a full period, which is the frequency. Okay, so it, the frequency is how frequently the vibrational motion occurs. Okay, so frequency, we denote it with the letter F. All right, and the frequency is equal to one over the period. Because the period measured in seconds is how long it takes for the process of the vibration to repeat itself. So the period is re the reciprocal of the frequency. And the period is represented by the letter uppercase T. So we say that F is equal to 1 over T. All right? Or you can say that T, the period, how long it takes the vibration to repeat, repeat itself is equal to 1 over F. And by the way, the units of frequency, obviously, if it's just one, one over period and period is measured in seconds, well, it must be, you know, this one over seconds, but there's a particular name given to that unit. So one over seconds is called the Hertz, and that's the name of that reciprocal time. Okay. 
and the wave described by frequency, speed, amplitude, and wavelength. Now we haven't talked about speed yet, we'll get to this one, but so far we've talked about all these others, frequency, amplitude, and wavelength, okay? So there, there we have it, frequency, the number of to and, fro, to and fro, you know, back and forth, vibrations in a given time unit. One vibration per second is one hertz. All right, and this is just the full word written out. If we were to write it in you know, typical units, it'd be with one hz, okay, with an uppercase h. And then the period defined as the time it takes for a complete vibration, for the cycle to repeat itself. And the unit is any unit of time, which is most awfully often the second. You know, sometimes it makes sense to do minute, especially if we're talking like revolutions per minute, RPM, right? In that case, the unit of time is the minute. And you might think, wait, is a revolution really an oscillation? Sure, because a revolution, like a turning wheel, that wheel comes back around and returns to where it started. So it very much is a vibrational motion, okay? All right. So the relationship between frequency and period. Frequency equals one over period. As I said before, the unit measured in hertz. Period is one over frequency, the unit seconds, okay? So the source of all waves is some sort of vibration, mechanical, electromagnetic, whatever, there's always some vibration that starts the wave. Higher frequency means increased rate of energy transfer and shorter wavelengths, okay? So as the frequency goes up, so we can say as the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. Now it decreases certainly for light because light has that fixed speed, which we've mentioned at the very end of the previous lecture, at the very end of lecture nine. So absolutely light is, is a very clear case. The frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. Okay, but there are other cases where you have to you have to acknowledge that you're holding something constant, such as you know the amplitude of the actual um, vibration. Okay, but in general, as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. Okay, so if the frequency of a particular wave is 20 hertz, its period is what? Okay, so make sure you can think about the relationship between frequency and period. Which must it be? What's the answer here? One twentieth of a second, 20 seconds, more than 20 seconds, or are none of these correct? Well, it's one twentieth of a second because we just take the frequency and we just take its reciprocal. So we just take one over 20, which of course just give us, gives us one twentieth. Okay. Now that last term, which we haven't formally defined, wave speed, because waves move. Vibrations don't. Vibrations are fixed, a fixed location. So that means that vibrations are only dependent on time. Waves are dependent on time and space, right? Because they're a moving vibration. Really, a wave is a moving vibration. I can always remember, move, wave is moving vibration. It's a really simple way to kind of break down what a wave is and make sure you understand it on a fundamental level. But since, since waves are moving, after all, they have to have some speed. And it shows that that speed is very easy to calculate. The wave speed describes how fast a disturbance moves through a medium. Okay, now I'm going to reiterate that in a second, but just let, let, that, let that sentence hold, hold in your mind. It is related to the frequency and the wavelength. Right? For example, a wave with a wavelength of one meter and a frequency of one hertz has a speed of one meter per second. Why is that? That's because the wave speed, right, which I'm just calling V with a subscript wave, so we know it's the velocity of the wave or the speed of the wave, right, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. It's as simple as that. It's just the product of the two. Okay? If you know, if you know both the frequency and the wavelength, you can find the speed. And that's because a really long wave that's, that's vibrating slowly, so it has a slow frequency, would still be moving pretty fast because it's so long. On the other hand, a wave that is both long and has a high frequency would be moving even faster. Okay? So it's always the product of the two. If they're both small, then the wave will be very slow. Okay? Now, what do we mean, though, when we said it moves through a medium? What is that? Why, why, did we, why, were the, why was the wording so particular there? What, what does it mean that it moves through a medium? Well, two common types of waves that differ because of the direction in which the medium vibrates compared with the direction of travel, okay? So there's two types of waves. And notice here, we're still talking about the medium and the motion of the medium, right? So let's think about these. We have a longitudinal wave and we have a transverse wave. These are in the table of contents. And I said that, you know, we have kind of particular cases of both. Remember longitudinal wave, that's going to be a sound wave. Transverse wave is going to be a light wave. But notice the example here. Notice the figure. In the figure, we saw a slinky. Okay, and the slinky, right, with you know the actual name brand of the thing, is being vibrated, and a wave is traveling along the slinky. But notice what's not happening: the slinky itself, or the slinky as a whole object, isn't moving, because the slinky is the medium. Okay, so notice then the wave moves through the medium, in this case the slinky, but the slinky itself doesn't move. The center of the slinky never moves in either case, either in the case of the longitudinal wave in A or the transverse wave in B. 
okay? That's what we mean that a wave moves through a medium. And this would also apply to air or water, or in the case of an electromagnetic wave, light, through a vacuum of space, okay? So now let's talk about the difference, okay? Because hopefully that idea of traveling through a medium, but the medium itself not moving has become more clear. Now, but what about the difference between longitudinal and transverse? Well, we see with longitudinal, it's all about regions of compression, compressed, and regions of stretching, stretched, okay? That's what a longitudinal wave is. Now in slinky, it's really clear because it's all about the elasticity of the slinky. You can clearly see where it's stretched out and where it's clearly compressed. In the case of a longitudinal wave, like a sound wave traveling through air or water, it's a little bit harder to see, obviously, and it has to do with the molecules of the air, for example, being compressed together in certain regions, which would be higher pressure, and then being less compressed, which is called rarefied, which is lower pressure. So we often actually talk about sound waves as pressure waves because we talk about the regions of compression and rare verification as high and low pressure respectively, okay? So, but that, that's what a longitudinal wave is, all right? And notice that the motion of the wave represented by this green arrow is the same direction as the regions of compression and stretching, okay? On the other hand, when we look at the transverse wave in figure B, right? There we see that the actual disturbance of the medium is perpendicular shown here to the direction of the wave because the wave velocity in both cases the wave speed all right is moving to the side but in the case of the transverse wave the disturbance the actual stretching of the slinky is up and down so transverse is all about perpendicular motion longitudinal is about parallel motion okay so the vibrations along a transverse wave move in a direction along the wave perpendicular to the wave both or neither why did i just say all right, along the wave, okay? So, oh, that would be a longitudinal wave, excuse me. I, I misread it. But the vibrations along a transverse wave are perpendicular. Whereas if this had asked for a longitudinal wave, well, in that case, it would have been A, along the wave, okay? But it's transverse despite me misreading it, and that means that it's perpendicular to the wave, okay? So in contrast, longitudinal waves are along or parallel, they both mean the same thing, to the direction of the wave travel. Okay, so hopefully that's clear about the difference. One parallel, the other perpendicular, okay? So sound, right? The nature of sound, our poster child of a longitudinal wave, the best, the best example, okay? So sound travels in longitudinal waves. The vibrating compressions and rarefications through air. Now sound can travel through other mediums other than air, but our ears are particularly good at hearing sounds in air, so that's what we'll be focusing on because we wanna focus on humans, okay? Now the speed of sound, is 340 meters per second at 20 degrees Celsius. Now it is dependent on temperature and if it's much colder, the, the wave will travel more slowly. If it's much hotter, the wave will travel more quickly. But it's never gonna vary too much. It just varies a few meters per second away from 340. So that's a good approximation, all right? So the good way to think about it is it's traveling at about a third of a kilometer per second, which means that in, in it takes three seconds for the wave to travel a kilometer. Okay. Now again, you you know we think more in miles and kilometers because we're in America, but in the rest of the world that'd make a lot of sense because you'd immediately be able to relate it to the distance you're all familiar with. But here we have to then make the conversion and think, okay, well, a kilometer is shorter than a mile, but regardless, it is about a third of a kilometer per second. Okay. So sound waves are fast, absolutely, right? That's why it's a big deal to have a, a plane, for example, that fa travels faster than the speed of sound. Okay. But it's a lot slower than light, that's for sure. Okay, and here is a visualization that would be difficult to do in, in, in practicality, but here we're actually seeing the molecules compressed in, in regions of compression, and we're seeing it rarefied. Now, when you look at an image like this, you want to read it just like we read an image of a transverse wave. So we could think of the regions of compression as amplitude above equilibrium, and the regions of rarefication as amplitude below equilibrium. So we could actually think of it as, you know, here's a high point, and then we pass through equilibrium to a low point, back up to a high point, and so on, right? So we could think of it like almost a side view of these compressions, okay, like that. Okay, so consider a person attending a concert being broadcast over the radio sitting about 45 meters from the stage. The person listens to the radio broadcast with a transistor radio over one ear and the non-broadcast sound signal with the other ear, right? So we can see like they have one ear just completely exposed, they're actually hearing the sound traveling that distance, and the other one, they're picking up on a radio. Further, suppose that the radio signal must travel all the way around the world. It's being reflected off satellites with no delay all the way around the world, okay? So, which signal will be heard first? 
the radio signal, the non-broadcast sound signal that only has to travel 45 meters, or both at the same time, all right? Or, or none of the above, which I guess means that you just wouldn't hear either sound. So let's go ahead and throw out D, okay? So which do you think it is? Now, I made a big deal that sound is much slower than light, but 45 meters is sure a short distance compared to the entire circumference of the planet. But which is it? Well, it turns out that they're actually both at the same time, and that 45 meters was chosen for a re reason. Because if you work it out, you can find that the time to travel 45 meters at a speed of 340 meters per second is about 0.13 seconds, or about 13 hundredths of a second. On the other hand, the time to travel four times 10 to the seven meters, which is 400 million meters, which is Earth's circumference, at a speed of 300 million meters per second is again, 13 hundredths of a second. So there you go, they both arrive at the same time. So if you sit further back at the concert, the radio signal would actually reach your ear first. That's because light is that much faster. But of course we are assuming no processing delay between whatever are the reflection points because there's no clear path for a light wave to, try to take all the way around the world. So it would have to pass through multiple satellites or radio towers or something, okay? So let's talk more about sound waves. We'll talk more about light later. So how is sound heard from a radio loudspeaker, right? How do we actually pick up the sound wave? The sound wave that we know travels through the medium but doesn't move the medium with it. So in other words, sound waves travel through air but don't carry the air along with them. They just travel through it. And, but they get to our ear somehow, they carry some energy, and then our ear picks up that tiny amount of energy and, tra and you know, translates it into sounds in our brain, right? So a radio loudspeaker is a paper cone that vibrates. The air molecules next to the loudspeaker are set into vibration, right? They, the actual air molecules are getting bounced around. This produces compressions and rarefications in the air. The sound waves then reach your ear, setting your eardrums into vibration. And that means the sound is heard. And there's particular parts of your ear, like the cochlea, that actually vibrate and pick up those different signals, and then we actually process those sounds, okay? Because there is some actual brain function, including like higher brain function involved in the processing these sounds. Okay, so this is just kind of showing the steps. Here we have the vibrating um, speaker, which creates these regions of compression and rarefication. And then it's getting picked up by a microphone in this case, instead of an ear, but then that microphone is gonna pick it up. It's then gonna turn that mechanical signal because sound waves are a mechanical wave. It's gonna turn them into a electrical signal, right? Via a circuit. And then that's gonna travel and show up on this device here known as an oscilloscope, which just shows the variation in current. And indeed we can see that nice sinusoidal wave that represents the sound wave, okay? Which is, by the way, a graph of pressure versus time. Because as I said before, it's really helpful to think of sound waves as pressure waves, because those regions of compressed and rarefied air definitely have variations in pressure relative to the baseline pressure, which would be the equilibrium pressure, which is atmospheric pressure. And that would be exactly halfway in between. The equilibrium pressure, is halfway between the point of most rarefied and most compressed, and it would be equal to just, you know, the pressure that if there was no sound wave traveling through that region of air, and so it would just be equal to one ATM, which we know is about 100,000 pascals, back from our chapter on fluids. Okay, so for each, each increase of one degree Celsius above zero degrees Celsius, the speed of sound increases by 0.6 meters per second. Okay, so this is the rule of the temperature dependence. This is a formula we need to know because it's a simple one to work with. So the order of increasing speeds of sound in air, it's about 340 meters per second. In warm air, it's something greater than 340 meters per second. Now, interestingly, a whole different story down here is what if we let sound travel through something other than air? Well, then it's not, it's not the temperature dependence that matters. It's the change of the medium. Because it turns out that anything that's denser than air will allow the sound to travel faster. The denser the material, the faster it travels. Because after all, it's all about the molecules getting pushed together and then spread apart. And if they're denser together, then there's more opportunities for them to get pushed together and spread apart. Even though they're not getting pushed together and spread apart as much, they're able to transmit that energy more quickly. So it turns out in water, sound travels four times faster. So it's tra traveling about 1,200. 100 meters per second or 1.2 kilometers per second. And in steel being very dense, it travels 15 times faster than in air. So sound travels very, very fast. If you like put your ear to a railroad track made out of steel, you would hear sound reach you much faster than the time it would take the sound to travel through the air, which is why you can hear a train first by putting your ear to the railroad track rather than listening to it from the air, okay? So yeah, because that's a big difference, 15 times faster through steel. So the interesting thing about waves in general and sound waves specifically is when they hit a hard surface, they bounce off of it. Now, obviously some of that energy is gonna be transmitted into the surface because you know if it's a steel wall and we already talked about the fact that sound can travel through steel, then obviously some of it will in fact travel through the steel. But 
other parts of it will reflect off. And there's different properties that depend how much bounces and how much transmits, but there's always some that bounces off and that's known as reflection. It's a process in which sound encountering a surface is returned and it's never 100%, but sometimes it can be pretty high. It's often called an echo and multiple reflections are called reverberate reverberations, okay? And reverberation means it's bounced off more than once. All right. And the interesting thing about reflection is there's a nice law that says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And I want to make that clear what I'm talking about. Well, let's just look at this ray right here. This is a ray of the wave. OK, now you might say, well, this doesn't look a lot like a wave. That's because we've kind of abstracting away the wave here. We're just talking about the direction of the wave and not actually showing the regions of rarefied air and compressed air like we were in the previous figures. But this is the direction of one particular sound wave. And we see here's the point of reflection, okay? And if we think of the angle of incidence, that's the angle that the wave makes with the surface, okay? So that could be this angle right here. That would be the angle of incidence, I for instance, incidence. And that angle has to exactly equal the angle of reflection. So theta sub r. And by the way, I'm using the Greek letter theta here because theta is basically the letter that we always use for angles, lowercase Greek letter theta. OK, and so those angles must be the same. So if you have a wave that that comes in head on and, and hits a wall, so it comes like straight on, then it's going to get reflected straight back the other way. On the other hand, if it comes in at a very steep angle, then it's going to get reflected at a very steep angle and so on. OK, now there's other types of reflections for surfaces that aren't perfectly smooth because most surfaces aren't, especially at the scale of individual molecules. So when sound or light is incident on a rough surface, and it doesn't have to be that rough, it is reflected in many directions. And that's the reason when you shine a light in your house, it, that light kind of lights up the whole room because the walls allow for diffuse reflection, so the whole room gets lit up, okay? So compared with a dry road, seeing is difficult when driving at night on a wet road. Why is that? Think about diffuse reflection here. So wet, a wet surface is smooth with less diffuse reflection, part of which would otherwise reach the driver's eye. On the, on the other hand, the wet road usually means a wet windshield, maybe that makes it harder, or the wet road usually means more vapor in the air, which would then maybe allow the wave to get bounced around more, or there's no reason, that's just the way it is. Well, I, D, I don't really like D, because that's not what the physical sciences are about. The physical sciences are about explaining phenomena, I'm not just saying that's the way it is. And you can also kind of use a good rule of thumb here about multiple choice and say the longest answer must be the right one, and indeed it is. The wet surface is smooth with less diffuse reflection. So that means when the light comes down and hits that smooth surface, it kind of just bounces right off with that same angle that it came in at. So then the light never reaches your eye, just get bou gets bounced off away from your eyes and away from the car, okay? Making it really hard to see, okay? And if it was perfectly smooth, you basically wouldn't see the road at all. You just see the single points where the light, the light hits it, okay? So reflection makes a lot of sense. You've probably heard of reflection because we thought about mirrors, right? And we'll talk about more about mirrors and the reflection of light in the next chapter where we, where we you know, specific, specifically talk about light. But there's also refraction. And this is a term that we don't hear that much. The way I want you to think about refraction is think about bending, okay? So when you think of reflection, think of bouncing. And when you think of refraction, think of bending. And it turns out that all waves bend when they travel from one medium to another. And they'll always bend a, a large amount or an appreciable amount if the mediums have different speeds at which the wave travels through them. Right? So for example, if we go from air to water, we know that the sound wave travels four times faster in water. That's a significant change in speed, which means we're going to get a significant amount of bending of the wave. Okay? So the bending of a wave due to a change in the medium and or the speed of the wave. Okay? Because technically, when we say and or, that's because we could have the, the same medium, like air, for example, and just have the temperature change, which then would create a different, a different speed, because we know that the, the speed of sound in air is dependent on the temperature. But you can kind of think of, of warm air as almost being a different medium. So it kind of just def depends on how you define it. But point being, when you travel from one medium to another, the speed changes and the wave must bend. Okay? And it's always going to bend in a way that it's going to bend towards the direction that is going to allow it to pass through the medium faster than, than it would otherwise, okay? So here we see that the, it's bending towards this direction here. It's bending towards the straight direction, which means that it's going to pass through the water faster than it would otherwise, okay? So sound waves refract when part of the wave front, all right, travels at different speeds, are affected by uneven winds, or when air near the ground has a different temperature, like warmer than the air above. 
So here we can see an example of the sound bending up towards the cool air or bending down towards the cool air, depending on if the cool air is above the ground or right at the ground, okay? In both cases, the sound bent towards the cool air, which allow, allows the sound to either bend up or down, okay? So dolphins emit ultrasonic waves to enable them to locate objects in their environment. And this is due to mostly reflection, right? Because they're actually bouncing that wave off. And when the wave comes back, they know if, if they're traveling towards it or away from it and how far away it is, right? And especially they know if they're traveling towards it or away from it because their ears quickly pick up that information, right? And their brains process that information. And that we'll talk about in just a moment when we talk about the Doppler effect. Okay. So what about forced vibrations and resonance, right? What is, what is that, right? Resonance is a really cool idea. What is it? Well, a forced vibration is setting up of a vibration in an object by a vibrating force, an external force, right? So this is like, you know, you shaking something. So an example, a factory floor vibration caused by running of heavy machinery, right? So the heavy machinery is forcing the floor to vibrate. That's an example of a forced vibration, okay? Now, the natural frequency is an interesting idea because everything has a natural frequency or usually a set of natural frequencies. Any object, any, you know, whether it's a stringed instrument or it's a factory floor has a natural frequency. It has a frequency that it wants to vibrate at. Even bridges have a natural frequency. It's its own unique fre frequency, or as I said, a set of frequencies. It depends on lots of properties, the geometry of the object, what it's made out of, how elastic it is. Right? Those are all things that go into considering what the natural frequency is. For complex things like a factory floor, it's very difficult to calculate. But for simple objects like a string, you basically just need to know what it's made out of and how, how like wide the string is. Okay? So then an example of a forced vibration is shown here with a tuning fork. Okay? Because this tuning fork has a particular natural frequency. Tuning forks are made in such a way that they really want to vibrate at one particular frequency. And here we have a sound wave coming in. And if that sound wave matches the natural frequency of the tuning fork, it's going to allow the tuning fork to vibrate a lot more than if the external frequency of the sound wave didn't match the natural frequency. So notice we get a very large vibration of the tuning fork due to the matching of the natural frequency of the tuning fork to the external frequency of the sound wave, okay? So resonance can be applied to engineering, and there's a famous case up in Washington State where a bridge fell apart because the natural frequency of the bridge, shown here, matched the external frequency of wind that came down this particular valley, and that caused much larger vibrations than wind normally generates, vibrations that the engineers didn't anticipate. And so when this particular type of seasonal windstorm came in, it tore the bridge apart because there was resonance. There was a matching of the external external rhythm or frequency to the natural frequency of the bridge, okay? So you don't want to build bridges with that particular natural frequency in this particular valley, right? And that's something that they should have investigated. Of course, engineers have learned from this mistake, among others, okay? All right, so that's the idea of resonance. Let's move on to talking about interference, which I talked about in the table of contents. What is interference? Well, interference is any time you have the combined effect of two or more overlapping waves. And for our purposes, it's really always gonna be two. So for example, let's imagine you drop two pebbles in a pond. When you drop those pebbles in a pond, they create splashes that spread out. We call those ripples, right? But what are they? They're a wave, right? They absolutely, they're a transverse wave in particular, right? On the surface of the water and they're traveling out. And what happens is those two sets of concentric circles of transverse waves on the surface of the water will start to overlap with each other. As they do so, there will create regions where they overlap in such a way that they constructively interfere, all right? Constructively interfere is where a crest overlaps with a crest or a trough overlaps with a trough. On the other hand, you can have a case where they destructively interfere, which could be a case where you have a crest, shown right here, that overlaps with a trough. Because see, I'll zoom in on this a bit, see we're exactly halfway between two crests. Because this, So this line right here would represent a trough because it's halfway between a crest here and a crest here. All right, and we know that troughs have to be always located exactly halfway between two crests. And so then if you think of the trough of this source, this pebble, well, when it overlaps with the crest of the other pebble, you have cancellation of the two waves because you've got a high point of the one wave and a low point of the other wave. And if the amplitudes are the same, they exactly cancel out and the waters return to equilibrium where it otherwise wouldn't be. All right, so that's an example of destructive interference. So it can be either constructive, 
where they're both where both waves are doing the same thing at the same time, or it can be destructive, or it could be anything in between, because you could certainly imagine cases where a trough overlaps with an equilibrium point, which would then mean that it's basically just a normal trough, but it still is an example of interference. Okay, so the two types, let's show it here in the slide. I kind of described it in the previous figure, but here we're gonna describe it in more detail. We have the constructive interference case. This is a crest of one wave overlapping with the crest of another wave, adding to a wave of increased amplitude. Now it can also be a trough, which means it could be an, it would just be an extra deep trough in the case of two troughs, two troughs overlapping, okay? And then destructive interference is a crest of one wave overlapping with the trough of another. And this creates an amplitude effect where this is reduced or completely gone, okay? So here is an example of two waves that are exactly lined up so that their crests and troughs exactly match. In that case, the interference of these two waves creates a wave that has extra high crests and extra deep troughs, okay? Now, in the case where we have a wave like this that has a crest and a trough that is exactly not lined up with another wave, so we see that instead, you know, these ones mean that we have a trough and a crest that are existing at the same time. Well, we have complete cancellation, which is to say destructive interference. Okay, and that absolutely happens and it can be applied. There are lots of applications of wave interference. You can either have waves interfere because they're slightly, they're slightly not lined up in time, which can create noise canceling headphones, or you can have cases where you're at a particular location where two wave, two like sound waves cancel out and you don't hear anything because you're at that location where they're canceling out. All right, so here are other examples, or there's a figure kind of elaborating on the same examples, right? So here we have two waves, two identical waves that are in phase. In phase just means lined up, right? So that means that they're, they're exactly matching up with each other. So they create a bigger wave, okay? And then we could see that in a, the case of a sound wave, right? Because you could think of this as the transverse wave in the upper image. And the lower one would be the longitudinal wave, which is the way we show um, the sound wave. All right, well, let me rewrite that, longitudinal, all right? So here we have the longitudinal wave and we have you know the crest shown and the trough shown. And you take two waves that are again in phase, lined up, and you just get a sound wave with, with extra compressed regions of air and extra rarefied regions of air. On the other hand, you can have a case where they exactly cancel out. Now the dotted lines here just represent where the wave would have been, just to show what, what canceled. And then you have a case where the two sound waves, the two longitudinal waves cancel out, and you're just left with air molecules as if there is no sound there, right? So really neat effect of wave cancellation or interference. Okay, so interference is a property of what? Sound, light, or both of those? Well, I bet you know, because they're both waves, so it's definitely both, okay? So interference has lots of applications, all right? So noisy devices such as jackhammers are equipped with a microphone that produce mirror image wave patterns fed to the operator's earphone, which cancel out the device's sound. So there's a digital process that's, that instantly takes the, the sound that's coming in, records it, and plays it back with almost no time lap, almost no time delay, I should say, and then you have this complete cancellation, right? Or nearly complete cancellation, which is pretty cool because it's really good for the ear. It helps, helps prevent ear damage, okay? Other applications of sound interference, sound interference in a stereo speaker out of phase, sending a mono or mono oral, which just means a single tone, like a pure tone, like just a pure, a pure single tone rather than like my human voice, which has many tones in it. So one speaker sending compressions of sound and the other signal sending rarifications. So they're out of phase. So then what happens is you have a point where the sound just completely cancels out, right? You bring them closer together and the sound is diminished, okay? All right, so another, um, not application, but another consequence of interference is the idea of beats. And we're not really talking like beats in music so much here. We're just talking this phenomenon of a variation in the, in the amplitude of the superimposed wave, or the wave that's composed of two waves interfering with each other, okay? So periodic variations in the loudness of sound due to interference. And when we say the loudness of sound, that's actually another way of saying amplitude. You know, so we saw, like before, we saw those figures and we saw the amplitude of the wave. Well, the amplitude of a sound wave is its loudness, right? Those are one and the same in terms of the meaning of that term, okay? So they occur for any kind of wave, but here we're considering sound waves in particular, and they, com they provide a comparison of frequencies. So imagine two tuning forks that are started at different points in time. Now, each tuning fork has the same frequency. They're identical tuning forks, but you hit one first, and the moment later, you hit the second one. 
which means the waves they produce are not in phase. There's a lag between them. So that means as the two waves are created and spread out into space with their given wave velocities, in this case, they're sound waves, so they're moving away at a speed of 340 meters per second. Well, what's going to happen to an observer over here, so imagine like a human ear over here, well, that ear is going to pick up as the waves pass over the ear, it's going to pick up points where the waves are constructive and points where they're destructive. And that's going to make a sound that varies in loudness. So it's still going to be a pure tone. It turns out it'll be a pure tone that's exactly halfway between the tones of the two waves. And so it's going to be something like, right? Because it's getting loud and soft. The amplitude is varying in time. And if the, if the waves have very similar frequencies, then the amplitude varies very slowly. If the frequencies are, are drastically different, then you really wouldn't notice the, the amplitude variation because it'd be happening so quickly, okay? So that's the idea of a beat. And it just has, it has to do with that variation over time of interference, okay? Okay. So interference also creates what are known as standing waves. And what, this is a really cool idea because it brings together some of the ideas we've already talked about, including reflection. So consider a, a girl here wiggling a rope or a string, okay? So she's going to wiggle it up and down, giving it a certain frequency. When that string hits the wall here where it's attached, it's going to bounce back and get reflected. And that means that there is always an incident wave and a reflected wave. And those two waves interfere with one another. And they interfere with one another to create points of cancellation, uh, in other words, destructive interference, and points of reinforcement, which is constructive interference. And depending on the frequency and the length, it turns out you can find exact, exact combinations that can create these known, what are known as standing waves. And the points of destructive interference are known as the nodes. That is a point of destructive interference. And there's always a node at either point because the, wa the reflected wave is always going to be exactly out of phase with the incident wave. So in other words, the incident wave might be a trough. The reflected wave will exactly be a crest. So they're always going to cancel out at the point of reflection. That's just a rule of waves, okay? And it depends on how the, how the rope is fixed to the wall. But if it's fixed really securely, then that will always be the case. Okay, and so you always are going to have a node at the connection point, and then in the case of a particular vibration that matches this length, you can end up with another node right in the middle. Now it turns out you can end up with more nodes than that, depending on the frequency. If you increase increase the frequency, you can get another standing wave. All right, but you have to have particular frequencies. But just because just some given arbitrary frequency won't create a standing wave, you have to make sure you've chosen just the right one. Okay, and in fact, you can have these cases which are called the harmonics of having different standing waves. So the lowest possible frequency that will create a standing wave creates a standing wave that has a wavelength that is one half as long, or excuse me, twice as long as the string. Because notice here, we're seeing one half a wavelength. So here we have a distance, the entire string has a length of L, and we see that L is equal to one half the wavelength, because we're looking at just half a wave here, okay? And it only has two nodes, okay, two nodes. On the other hand, if you if you increase the frequency, so this would be a low frequency, if you increase it a bit, so you just like brought it up, you start vibrating it more, more. and at, at first, if, if you went from this low frequency to a higher frequency, and you, you kind of gradually started to move your hand faster, at first the string is just going to be all messy, and you're not going to get much pattern at all, but then as you continue to vibrate it more, you can kind of find that sweet spot where you then will create another nice standing wave. The next stable standing wave that's created has the node right in the middle like the previous figure on the last slide. And this one has a total of three nodes. And in this case, the length of the string exactly equals the wavelength of the standing wave. And again, when we say standing wave, that's a bit of a misnomer because the standing wave is actually a combination of two waves because it is the interference of the original wave, the so-called incident wave, and the reflected wave. Okay? So combination of two waves. Right? Every standing wave, although we call it a standing wave, is actually two waves, okay? And then if you continue to increase the frequency, right, so it made it even higher, then you can get to a case where you have now more nodes, right? So you have five nodes, right? Excuse me, four. I don't know why I wrote five, all right? And in this case, we have that the length is two-thirds the length of the standing wave, all right? Or I should say that the the length, oh, length is three halves, because now the, the string is longer, right? So it was, so L would be three halves lambda, okay? 
is that now the string is actually longer than the wavelength. So at first the wavelength was so long that it was longer than the string, then they exactly match each other, and now the wavelength is actually shorter than the string because this is one whole wavelength here, and we see that it, it is only two thirds of the overall length of the string, which is to say that the length is three halves of lambda, okay? All right, so those are all cases of standing waves, and you can continue to go up higher and higher and get more and more nodes in a shorter and shorter wavelength, okay? All right, so now onto the Doppler effect. I mentioned the Doppler effect in passing back on the slide about the dolphins, because that's one of the big things that echolocation is good for, whether we're talking about dolphins or bats. They, they can use echolocation to find out how far something is, because they can bounce the sound and kind of wait for it to come back, but it doesn't seem like they really kind of know how long it takes for the sound to come back. But what their brains are really good at is noticing the difference in the sound, because when the sound bounces back towards the dolphin or the bat, they can tell if they're moving towards the thing that the sound bounced off of, like a wall, for example, like a cliff, or if they're moving away from it, because there will be a change in frequency depending on if they're moving away or towards it. And that phenomenon is known as the Doppler effect. It is the change in frequency as measured by an observer due to the motion of a source or the listener. So in this case, it's probably the dolphin, that's the, the listener that's moving, but I suppose it could be the source if the, if the thing that the dolphin is bounce, bouncing its, its supersonic wave off of is a boat, because in that case, the boat, the boat would be the source and it's the thing that's moving. And I say supersonic because that's what we always talk about when we talk about dolphin sounds, but that's supersonic relative to the human ear. Obviously, dolphins can hear their own sounds that they make, but the human ear cannot, okay? And this Doppler effect is named after the Austrian, Austrian physicist and mathematician Christian Johann Doppler. All right. So the idea of the Doppler effect can be represented with a figure like this. So imagine the top view of water waves made by a stationary bug. Okay. Now you might think, well, this isn't the sound; these aren't sound waves. But it's good to start with maybe something you can really easily visualize, like ripples in a pond. Okay. So this little bug is swimming and it's making little ripples. Right. So in still water, all these ripples would be exactly exactly symmetric concentric circles. But what happens when the bug starts to swim, all right? So in the case where the water waves made by a bug swimming in still water towards point B, so now the bug is actually moving in this direction. The bug has a certain velocity. Well, now what happens is as each wave is generated, and it's probably generated with each stroke of the bug's legs, now the, the bug is moving towards one set of those waves and moving away from the other set, which means now you have this asymmetric set of concentric circles with a region where they're closer together on one side, on the in this case on the side where the bug is moving towards, and further apart on the other. That's going to create a difference in the frequency that those waves would pass over some sensor, some listener. Now in this case you don't really listen to ripples in a pond, but imagine if these are sound waves. Well then if you put an ear here, you're going to hear difference depending on if the ear is at point A or point B. And you're going to hear where the waves are shorter, where the wavelength is shorter in the direction that the bug is swimming. That's going to cause an increase in frequency, which means you're going to have a higher pitch on the sound that the bug is moving towards. And you're going to have a lower pitch, which is to say lower frequency, because pitch and frequency are interchangeable terms. You're going to have a lower pitch on the side where the bug is moving away from. Okay, so the frequency of waves received by an observer increases as sound sources approach, and the wave fre frequency decreases as sound so sources recede. That's because they're more spread out. The wavelength is increased on the receiving on the receding side, and the wa the wavelengths are more compressed together on the approaching side. All right, so here we have short wavelength, and here we have long wavelength. Okay, and short wavelength means high frequency. And long, long wavelength means low frequency, because as wavelength goes up, frequency goes down, and vice versa. And that is, again, assuming that the velocity is held constant, but it is because it's sound waves. And as long as the temperature didn't drastically vary as the, in this case, fire truck passed by you, then it's all, it's all the same velocity of 340 meters per second, okay? So when a fire engine approaches you, the speed of its sound increases, the frequency of the sound increases, or the wavelength of its sound increases, or do they all increase? Which is it? Make sure you can answer this one, all right? You ready? It's the frequency of the sound increases, all right? So be, be sure you distinguish between sound speed and sound frequency. Okay, so the Doppler effect occurs for sound, for light, or both. Well, we kind of have this, this overarching rule that, that anything that applies to one wave, like sound, also should apply to another wave, like light. So I bet it's both, and indeed it is. Definitely both. And actually, the Doppler effect of light is really important for astronomers because they use it to measure the spin rate of stars and to measure whether galaxies are moving away from us and at what rate. All right? 
So now a little bit about bow waves. So the bow waves are the wave pattern made by a bug swimming at the wave speed. So this would be a pretty fast bug in most cases, all right? But the idea is it can catch up with its own waves. Notice this, right? If the bug is swimming fast enough, it's catching up with its own waves. So in this case, the idealized wave pattern made by a bug swimming faster than the wave speed, all right? So now we end up with this bow wave shape. That's what a bow wave is, all right? So bug, a bug swims at successively greater speeds. Overlapping at the edges occurs only when the bug swims faster faster than the wave speed, all right? So we can see a case where it's slower, where the velocity of the bug is less than the velocity of the wave. Here, V sub W is the velocity of the wave. So we call this wave speed, all right? And then just V is the bug speed, all right? And so as it swims faster and faster, it eventually catches up. Here where they're exactly equal to each other, they just kind of overlap. And when they exceed it, they push past that overlap. And then we have a case of you know, it being a little bit faster or greatly faster, the bug being greatly faster than the wave speed. And this creates a shock wave at the moment that the, the bug velocity or the plane velocity exceeds the wave velocity, there is a shock wave, a pattern of overlapping spheres that form a cone from an object traveling faster than the speed of sound. Now, in the case of the water, it wouldn't be a cone because it's kind of restricted to the air-water interface at the top of the water. But in the case of air, it's truly a three-dimensional phenomenon, which creates that big cone of, of energy release, which is the shock wave. All right? So the shock wave actually consists of two cones, a high-pressure cone with its apex at the bow, that, you know, that point where the waves are overlapping, and a low-pressure cone at the apex at the tail. All right? And a graph of the air pressure at ground level between the cone takes the shape of the letter N. So a big spike there passing through equilibrium back down to a very low spike on the other end. But that creates a huge variation in pressure, which can be hard on ears. So shock waves can be really dramatic if they occur near you. And they can also shatter glass because it's a lot of energy. Okay? So the shock wave has not yet reached listener A, but it is now reaching listener B and has already reached listener C. Okay? So... Graphical representations of noise and music are shown here. So noise has no clear repeatable pattern. It's, it's known as what's a, ran, a random amount of waves. But music has a frequency and a repeatable pattern with, with definable wavelength and speed. Now it's not a perfect sine wave. We can see it has some you know, intricacies to it, but it definitely is a repeatable pattern. That's what makes it more pleasant to the ear. Okay. Now some, some, some musical sounds may be more pleasant than others, but they're definitely different than noise, noise being truly random. Okay, and now back onto what I talked about before, this idea of harmonics, and this figure sp specifically shows the names of the harmonics, because I talked about how the, the lowest frequency creates the longest standing wave possible. Well, that longest standing wave possible is known as the first harmonic, and as you increase the, the frequency, you get to the second harmonic, which is the second longest standing wave possible, and then the third harmonic, and then one we hadn't seen in the previous figure, the fourth harmonic. Right? And these are terms that are, are applicable to stringed instruments like a piano or a violin, but can also be applied to wind instruments if we think of the sound trapped in the tube of that wind, that wind instrument. All right. And so the images of a piano and clarinet playing note C are shown here, the piano and the clarinet. And each has the same frequency, which you can clearly see by glancing at the figure, but they have some differences. Right? The, the C is not exactly the same between those two instruments, which is why we can distinguish between the instruments. They might prefer one in a particular musical en ensemble compared to another. All right. Well, there you go. There's our introduction to waves and to sound waves, and hopefully that will further clarify things we've seen before, such as the, the propagation of energy through radiation, and we'll set the stage for the very next lecture, lecture 11, where we're going to get into light, another wave. Thank you so, so much for watching. I hope it's been interesting.